When one thinks of GE, one normally thinks of kitchen appliances and perhaps consumer electronics. It's important to remember, though, that GE is more than just an electronics company. They've had their fingers in pretty much every possible pie there is, including transportation. Most notably for the subject of this video, rail transport. The company would partner up with Alco in the late 20s to produce the first diesel switcher in the United States. This partnership would continue to grow and blossom for the next decade or so, with Macintosh and Seymour providing the power plants and or prime movers for Alco, and GE handling all the electronics as it had with that first switcher. Diesel-propelled switchers and locomotives alike would soon become a force to reckon with in the industry. Just as it appeared diesel technology would begin to have more market penetration and or take the lead from steam technology in the railroad industry, World War II struck, changing plans. In the United States, the War Production Board began to rationalize production to improve efficiency. One of the items that would be rationalized, and unfortunately for Alco, would be diesel locomotives. After World War II, the country ignited in terms of its economy, and there was a huge demand for diesel road locomotives. This was spurred on by increasing labor rates and salary requirements, as well as unionization, that in general made operating steam locomotives highly impractical and highly unprofitable. Many railroads would dieselize early to save themselves from these massive regulations, further driving up the demand for diesel locomotives. Alco would find itself in the thick of the action. It was always number two to Baldwin Locomotive Works, which was the steam locomotive maker of the time, and I do mean the, producing more steam locomotives than any other builder of the time. The company, however, would not be successful in diesel production as it failed to grasp the importance of developing a diesel prime mover until far too late. Baldwin would pay dearly for the lack of development toward its diesel locomotives, and it would be out of business by the late 50s. Luckily, the same could not be said for Alco. The company had introduced a model called the RS-1 before World War I, which would provenly become a revolution after the war finally ended. Its concept was simple, combine the abilities of a switcher and a road locomotive into one package, allowing for more flexibility, as well as economies of scale for railroads. This locomotive would prove to be one of the times Alco managed to get a leg up on General Motors, as General Motors lacked anything in its catalog to match this locomotive's capabilities, despite it only having a thousand horsepower. Alco would refine the concept with its RS2 and its infamous 244 prime mover, which, while more powerful than anything GM had at the time, would prove to be unreliable. Alco would then follow this up with its RS3, essentially with the same body, but in an increase of horsepower of 100 over its predecessor. While the Alco RS3 would outsell its predecessors several times over, it would actually prove to be an Achilles heel for Alco, exposing all the problems with the underdeveloped and rushed 244. This would permanently destroy Alco's reputation. The company would never produce an engine that sold quite as well as the RS3 ever again. From this point on, in the 1950s going to the early 60s, with the notable exception of the RS11, the company's sales for a locomotive were lucky to reach 100, while GM continued to sell locomotives in the thousands. This is again caused by the infamous reputation of the 244, several quality control issues, bad marketing, bad design, and overall bumbling caused by Alco's lack of experience producing diesel locomotives. By the late 1950s, GE had had enough and decided to break off their partnership with Alco, while it would continue to sell electrical components to the company, allowing Alco to continue to produce its locomotives, GE was going to branch out on its own and produce its own road locomotive, one that would revolutionize the industry, as GE always tried to in whatever industry it got itself into. Needless to say, these plans would not be reported to its former partner and now competitor, Alco. GE was no stranger to producing locomotives. In addition to producing the unsuccessful Fairbanks Morris Erie built for Fairbanks Morris at its Erie facility, during the late 1940s, the company also produced a series of industrial switchers known by the tonnage and unofficially known as the tonner line. The first in this series was known as the 25 tonner after its total tonnage. Its tiny little six-cylinder engine produced by the Cummins Corporation produced 150 horsepower at 1800 RPMs. The ultimate development of GE's switchers, however, would be the GE 70 tonner. 
238 of these particular switchers would be produced between 1947 and 1955. This particular switcher lacked the side rods of some of GE's earlier models, relying on traditional traction motors to drive each of the four axles. The locomotive was also more conventional in its design, looking more like a scaled-down Alco S-series locomotive. Another unique and unconventional feature, at least for GE at the time, was the locomotive's Cooper Bessemer power plant, which generated 500 to 600 horsepower, depending upon the specific model in question. It was this basic design that would help GE launch its revolutionary new U-series of locomotives, short for Universal. 238 of these particular switchers would be produced between 1947 and 1955. If GE learned one thing from producing these small switchers, it was the fact that it really needed to produce its own prime movers if it wanted to get into mass production. As subcontracting out the prime movers even across multiple vendors such as Cummins, Cooper, Bessemer, etc. still failed to provide the stability in the supply chain GE needed if it was going to produce locomotives in the numbers it wanted to. In short, they would have to produce and manufacture their own prime mover if they wanted to achieve this. The prime mover that would eventually emerge out of this particular design would be called the FDL-16. It would share a few traits in common with its now former partner Alco's prime movers, being four cycle combustion and turbocharged. This would allow for greater efficiency and more ease in getting more horsepower out of it. Based upon or an embellishment of the Cooper Bessemer power plant that was underneath the hood of the 70 tonner. Initial testing of this prime mover was carried out quite cleverly, as GE would disguise the locomotive as not only an export locomotive, but appearing to look like an EMDF unit. The initial horsepower rating of the prime mover started out around 2,000 horsepower, but would steadily be increased until it reached 2,500. This is a magic number as it would outperform one of the most powerful locomotives at the time, the Fairbanks Morris Trainmaster, by a total of 100 horsepower. The seemingly small increase in horsepower was still very significant for GE, since no single locomotive had been able to exceed the 2,400 horsepower benchmark introduced by the Fairbanks Morris Trainmaster all the way back in 1953. It was now approaching the end of the 50s. This would give GE the most powerful single locomotive available, and not to mention the bragging rights to go along with it. The resulting locomotive would be known as the U25B. This might sound like gobbledygook to the uninitiated rail fan, but the translation is actually quite simple. The U stands for Universal Series, as discussed before. 25 stands for the horsepower rating, and B stands for the truck type. In this case, B meaning two axles per truck. Hence, the U25B. Looking at the engine from the outside, the U25B has many distinctive spotting features, most notably these humps on the back which are on either side which contain the battery boxes. We also note the radiator slots. This is notable on this model as it was one of the first locomotives to contain a pressurized engine compartment, a feature that Alco would later add to all of its models. The purpose of a pressurized engine compartment is to keep dirt and particulate away from the engine itself, thus improving reliability. There isn't much to be said for the profile of the side of the locomotive until we get to the cab, which is pretty distinctive in the way it's designed, with the two smaller windows bracketing a double window in the middle, which of course slides open and can also be equipped with a bay design to allow for better visibility. The cab on this particular example features a more streamlined nose which has been curved for better wind resistance, which has also been slanted down to improve visibility as well as wind resistance. Earlier models had an unstreamlined flat nose, the cab also features a wide picture window for better visibility for the crew. Inside we find a very comfortable cab with four seats, almost captain's chairs like with armrests on either side, allowing for accommodations for not just the crew, but two additional personnel, perhaps a conductor or a road foreman. Another feature of this locomotive is that the cab was air-conditioned, an uncommon feature for locomotives at the time. The cab is well laid out in general, with the controls coming easy to hand and easy to find. Again, attention was paid to ergonomics, something that would have never been even put as a remote concern in the past for locomotive builders. The locomotive also featured 
other features to make life easier for the crew in general, such as advanced wheel slip detection. To say production was slow to get going for this locomotive was an understatement. Despite two tours of the nation's railway systems, one conducted in 1960 and the second conducted in 1961, totaling over 100,000 miles, no sales were generated. Finally, months later in the summer of that year, and much to the relief of many GE execs, I'm sure, Union Pacific placed an order of four locomotives to kick off production. Despite all the features that GE built into this locomotive and its bragging rights at being the most powerful single locomotive available at the time, the Du-25B just wasn't a big seller, selling a mere 478 units in its production run from 1959 to 1966. The reluctance of the railroads to purchase this locomotive could have been due to the infamous reputation of GE's former partner's Alco's products. Both the Alco products at the time, as well as the new GE U25Bs, were four-cycle combustion and turbocharged, which both terms were becoming four-letter words in the industry at that time. Due to reliability issues that railroads had experienced with this type of locomotive, whether it be due to lack of maintenance and or improper maintenance, or just design flaws. There are several other possible reasons for the lackluster sales of this locomotive, including one of course being the fact that GE had just started producing locomotives and you will never as a rule buy the first product of a brand new company for obvious reasons of quality control, questions about how good the company would be, etc. Also, issues with this locomotive as with any new product despite all of the quality testing GE had done before releasing the locomotive to its customers still persisted, most notably issues with the turbocharger for the FDL-16 Prime Mover. One might wonder if issues like this would spell an end for GE, after all it had just started production of this locomotive and had invested quite a bit of money into getting it off the production line, and such a loss could cripple the company. Well, that's where GE and Alco essentially differed. You see, unlike Alco, GE had deep pockets, pesos, Marks, euros, dollars, moolah, kasha, gelt. In short, they had cash to spend and weren't afraid to spend it to keep their customers happy. Say you bought a U25B and experienced some unfortunate problems with it. GE would do the following, most likely sending a team of customer representatives well-dressed over to your railroad to apologize for the lack of performance of the item and offer to give you an excellent trade and deal on the new model. Assuming your <coughs> customer feedback to GE was a few years after your purchase, most likely a model such as a U30B, as that particular model had several enhancements, including the increased horsepower to 3,000 even. Say you couldn't finance it? No trouble at all. GE would help you finance it. And say you had trouble making the payments? Well, not necessarily a problem there, too. They wouldn't obviously go out of their way to advertise this, but if GE found you were struggling to make payments and it had trouble with your other locomotive, they would most likely make things work. If it meant forgiving some of the debt, if it meant changing the financial terms, they would do it. Now, companies like GM would sit and sort of laugh at its upstart competitor making such decisions. After all, the company had made its profit margins by maximizing profit in every part of its divisions, including the railroad division, by basically getting every last cent out of every last one of its produced locomotives. This is to say, sticking to stiff financing charges and refusing to do anything in, sh in short of customizing the locomotive and making sure to keep warranty expenses to a minimal. While it is true that it is the mission of a company to be profitable and as much as possible in order to keep itself afloat and as prosperous as possible so it can continue to grow, especially a corporate entity that has stockholders to keep those stockholders happy, the fact of the matter is, GE was playing the long game and saw another business model coming in here. Instead of pushing profit margins at first, they would go after the customer base and or develop a customer base for themselves. The idea here, really quite simply, is that GE was going to work on basically getting customers, while GM was working on getting every last cent. It was easy to dismiss this as a foolhardy mission from the start. However, in later years, it would prove very successful as GE would eventually take over the market. But again, that came much later on. For the time being, GE's products were new to the market, had high operating costs and somewhat questionable reliability. But the company was slowly but surely starting to get a foothold. This first model, the U25B, 
and its six-axle sister, the U-25C. It may have been flawed, but it would allow the company to take a critical first step and would very quickly unseat Alco as the number two diesel locomotive manufacturer. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. Please subscribe as it will help me greatly. And as always, keep the metal side down.